Okay, um, this is going to be the weirdest question to start a sermon you've probably ever heard in your life. But how many of you here, at some point in your time, in your life, got into a fist fight? Several, several. Um, wow, I'm, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I'm looking across this congregation and I'm like, seriously? Listen, I only got in one fight in my whole life because this is all about love. But, <laughs> but, but it was in eighth grade, and, uh, and I'm a peacemaker. And so there was this one bully kid, and he was kind of jumping up on this big kid's back. And, you know, the big kid was just kind of a slow kid. Nice kid, but a little slow. And he kept jumping up on his back and, like, harassing him and giving me a ride. And, everything. and I just, I didn't like that. It was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to stand for that. And I just went up to him, and I grabbed him by the shoulder, and I spun him around, and I said, hey, stop that. And when I spun him around, he sucker punched me. And I'm telling you what, and you know what it's like when you get into a fight, right? Immediately there's a release of adrenaline, all your senses get really heightened, and you get tunnel vision on just one subject. And, and we locked horns, and I'm telling you what, we started going at it. It was a winter time, and um, God gave me favor because he slipped on the ice and he went down. And when he was on his hands and knees, I was going to do a haystack on him and pile drive him into the ground and finish this thing once and for all. Come out, you know, we are the champions the whole night. And, and right when I started in that haymaker, a nun, because I'm tunnel vision, I can't see what's going around me. This was a Catholic school, by the way, because I was raised a good boy. And a nun come up from behind me. Now you got to understand, most nuns are probably nice, but at St. Pat's School in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, they were ex-Navy SEALs. These nuns, they were all like six foot six, 300 pounds, you know, uh, and, and I mean, and, and this nun grabbed me by the nap of the neck and pulled me back right when I was on my downswing. I dislocated my shoulder in five different places. I know you say you can only dislocate it in one. It was five. It was like pop, 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 pop as I came down. And, and I was so ticked off because she robbed me of the glory of a victory. I mean, I was going to absolutely pound that kid into the ground. So here's the deal. This morning, whether you've ever been in a fight or not, I've ever experienced that, you are in a fight. You are in a fight this morning. You are in a fight for your families. You are in a fight for your future. You are in a fight for your destiny. And more than all of those things, you're in a fight for those people who aren't even fighting for themselves. Because that's what we're called to do. You see, Matthew chapter 28, God gives a definitive when Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. That go is for every single man, woman, and child in the body of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, that is an empirical command to everyone who believes to go into all the world and make disciples. We are not to be a holy huddle. We are not to, we're rather to be a hostile company. We're to be out there taking ground. You know, otherwise the church is nothing more than a moose lodge right? But we're not about that. We're about really taking ground. And, and it's not about reclining in our Christianity, but doing what God wants us to do. And let me tell you something. Sunday morning church attendance is not God's will for your life. That is not God's plan for your life to just go to church Sunday morning. Christianity is not a little piece of my life. Christianity becomes an entirely new identity. I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. That now becomes the lens that I look through everything. That speaks to me on how I'm going to be a husband. That speaks to me on how I'm going to be a dad. That speaks to me on how I'm going to be an employee or an employer. That speaks to me as far as my, my finances and every aspect of my life. Christianity becomes the lens that I view and base and build everything upon. I'm a follower of Jesus. It's not just I'm living my life and then on Sunday mornings I go to church. That's not God's will for followers of Jesus Christ. But to be engaged and to be all about what God wants to do. Now listen, here's the thing. If you want revival, and I believe, you know, people, oh, I want revival. If you want revival, you are responsible for your revival. Because nothing can stop it. You're responsible for your own personal, right now, right here, you're responsible for your revival. And one of the biggest keys in becoming pumped up and becoming revived is to start fighting for those who aren't even fighting for themselves. To start fighting for those who aren't even fighting for themselves. I found this quote from Joan of Arc. Everybody know who Joan of Arc was, right? Noah's wife? <laughs> no, just, just kidding. 
Joan of Arc, actually Joan of Arc as a 16-year-old peasant French girl said she received visions from um, uh, the archangel Michael. And uh, the command from God was to throw off English oppression. France was at that time locked in the 100-year war with England. England had occupied France, and her dictate was to throw off English oppression. She went to the king, who was partly insane at the time, and, um, and, and he allowed, at this point now, a 17-year-old girl, an 18-year-old girl, to take charge of his armies. Now think about this. An 18-year-old girl is leading the armies of France, and she gets into one victory after another victory after another victory after another victory after another victory. At 19, she's kidnapped by the English, she's brought to England, she's tried, and she is burned at the stake. And while she's on trial, she says this, I know this now, every man gives his life for what he believes. Every woman gives her life for what she believes. Sometimes people believe in little or nothing, and yet they give themselves to that little or nothing. One life is all we get, and we live it as we believe in living it, and then it's gone. But to sacrifice what you are and to live without belief, that's more terrible than dying. To live without passion is worse than dying. To live without drive is worse than dying. To live without a purpose is worse than dying. And God is the one that gives people purpose. So many people living purposeless lives because they haven't found those purposes in the one who absolutely created them. Now let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of this church? Who's going who's to guess? What's the purpose of the, of the church? Ha, 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 who said it? Welcoming people to experience new life through Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a dollar after the end of the service. You see me. Better yet, I'm going to give you a free cup of coffee. All right? The purpose of this church is welcoming people to experience new life in Jesus Christ. It is on all of our literature. It is plastered out in the the wall of the foyer. That's what we're all about, welcoming people to experience uh, new life in Jesus Christ. If you're like, well, I don't agree with that, then find another church that has a different philosophy. That is what we breathe. That is our DNA. Now, in the church... We all have jobs, right? I'm the pastor. There's some that are deacons, and then there's some who are department head leaders. There's people who work in the welcoming team. There's people that work in a worship team. There's people that work in kid zone. There's people that work in the nursery. There's people that work in the food pantry. There's people, I mean, we just got a million ministries going on. And so everyone's got this stuff going on. And if I went to you and said, hey, what, what's your job in the church? You might say, well, I'm a deacon. Uh, hey, what's your job in the church? Well, I work in kid zone. Uh, Hey, what's your job in the church? Well, uh, I'm on the welcoming team. Uh, Your job in the church is welcoming people to experience new life in Jesus Christ. My primary job is not the pastor. My primary job is welcoming people to experience new life in Jesus Christ. Your primary job is welcoming people to experience new life in Jesus Christ. That is our DNA. You need to think it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it, and then do it. That is what we're all about. Welcoming people to experience. Uh, You might have a function. You might say, well, you know, I play in the worship team, or I function in the nursery, or I do this or that, and that's wonderful. But our jobs are welcoming people to experience new life in Jesus Christ. In other words, our job is to fight for those who aren't even fighting for themselves. And so my question is, is how are you doing at your job today? How are you doing at your job? I want to look at a scripture this morning and just let me just kind of back up and kind of unpack it and set the, the scene of what's going on. You know the history of Israel, right? Uh, Jacob has 12 sons. 12 sons become a little 12 clans. The clans move to Egypt to avoid a famine. In Egypt, they swell to 3 million people. They're put into slavery. Moses comes. Moses delivers them, brings them into the promised land. They become a kingdom in the promised land. They go through kings and all these things, and then they split. Ten northern tribes become Israel. Two southern tribes become Judah. Israel falls into apostasy and are carried away into Assyria. The two southern tribes eventually fall into apostasy and idolatry, and they're carried away into Babylon. For 70 years, they're in Babylon. In Babylon, there's a guy by the name of Nehemiah, a Jewish man born in captivity in Babylon. And he hears about Jerusalem, and he's always asking what's going on in Jerusalem. 
Hey, what's the DL in Jerusalem? And so finally somebody says, man, the city is deplorable. It's burnt. The walls are down. Everything's torn up. The people are living there in fear. And so he's a cupbearer to the king. And he goes before the king, and the king grants him favor because God is in this, and the king allows him to return to Israel and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And while he's in Israel, he, he, he starts, now you've got to understand something, he never saw Israel. He never set foot in Israel. He never saw Jerusalem. He never stepped foot in Jerusalem. But something stirred in him that was unacceptable, that the prophetic destiny of Jerusalem, which means city of peace, was in ruins. Something stirred in him, and he said, I don't care if I die, I've got to do something. And so he goes to Jerusalem, and they start rebuilding the walls, and then all of a sudden, there's these two characters that appear in the narrative of Nehemiah, and that's Sanballat and Tobiah. And they begin to resist him. They begin to ridicule him. They begin to slander him. And when that doesn't work, they begin to go out and get the neighboring armies to say, hey, you better take notice what's going on over there. And this is where we pick up the story because the people are now getting fearful of what these armies might do. And so, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah there it is, okay, let me go back. Nehemiah, okay. It says, when I saw their fear, I arose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Listen to what he says, do not be afraid. 365 times that is found in the scriptures. One for every day of your life. Do not be afraid of them. And yet, he says, remember the Lord. How do you not fear something? To remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. And then look what he says. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. There it is right there. He's saying, listen, fight. Get some metal in you. Get some backbone in you. Stop being afraid and start fighting and build the things that God wants built. Establish the things that God wants established. Then he goes on into verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their, their plans, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. And from that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held spears and shields, the bows and the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. So we get this picture where Nehemiah is like, listen, don't be afraid of the people who are resisting and opposing the things of God. Remember that our God is totally awesome. He is the God over all of the things that are seen and unseen. He's, he's, he's the top dog. There's no one beyond God. He's awesome. He's great. He's mighty. And so don't be afraid of them. Keep fighting and keep building the things God's building. Keep fighting for the things that God wants you to fight for. And he says, listen, fight for your brothers, your sisters, your family. Fight for those people who aren't even fighting for themselves. Because that's the purposes of God. You've all heard this term that says, choose your battles. You ever hear that? You know, there's all kinds of conflict in life, and it says, choose your battles wisely. And I mean, you know, being in a leadership position, being a pastor of a church, you've got to live by that motto. Choose your battles wisely. In marriage, I mean, come on, in marriage, huh? Right? Is it really right to go to war over who's left the toilet seat up or anything like that, right? Is it really right to, you know, go nuclear over some dishes left in the sink? I mean, right, you're trying to pick and choose here. You're trying to choose your battles. You know, there's, there's one little thing. I've never even mentioned it to Darlene, and I don't think she's, you know. So, so, so sometimes Darlene leaves things behind the kitchen sink, like, you know, a pan to dry or soap dispensers or sponges. And, and you know, my big gorilla hands, I go in there to turn the faucet on, and I keep hitting stuff. It's just a little tiny thing. Who can, I've never even brought it up. And I would never bring it up other than the fact that it serves as a great little illustration that that is just something that you, you know, she's taking one for the kingdom here this morning. That's just, you know, you, and, I, and I feel so, but you got to understand, I feel really bad in even bringing something like that up because she can never find anything on me. So, so, okay, a couple of those laughs were a little too hearty. Um, 
So, but I mean, there's definitely things where you have to choose your battles on and you have to ask yourself, listen, is this worth it? And you kind of triage the situation and you say, is this really going to be worth it? Well, I look at athletes and, 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 I, and I'm an athlete in a fat man's body and it drives me crazy because, you know, I look at athletes and, I, and like they starve themselves. Some of them just don't even look healthy. I mean, they, they're like starved, they deprive themselves and all they do is exercise. Why? For a ring, for, for a Super Bowl ring or for a, a, a cup, a Stanley Cup, or for a title, or for whatever it is, because they value the goal, because that ring, or that cup, or that title means everything to them. And so they value that, and they drive themselves into incredible disciplines, because they value the goal. Now come on, guys, I'm going to speak to you guys here for a moment this morning. Come on. You remember when you met that little something, you know, and, and, and you value, like, there, there, what, what kind of price tag did you put on that? You, you know, you're like, wow. You remember what it was like, you get on the phone, and you're talking to, you know, you're talking to your girlfriend, like, for three hours, you're on the phone, and at the end of three hours, you don't have nothing to say, but you're not hanging up, because you're just, like, hearing each other breathe. That goes out the window after about year four, right? So, so you know, and, and then you're like, oh, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. All right, on the count of three, we'll hang up together. One, two, three. Oh, you didn't hang up. You know, you know, like we're retarded, right? We're like just totally, we're in love and we just, you know, it's crazy. Why? Because, because it's worth it. Because we're looking at the prize and we're saying it's worth it. Listen, I once dated a psychic who broke up with me before we met. <laughs> Some of you at around two o'clock this afternoon, you're going to go, what? You're going to, you know, and it's going to, but... But listen, when I was dating Darlene, I was as skinny as Pastor Brian. I kid you not, because I was starving to death. I had a low-income job, and, uh, and I was dating Darlene. I had car payments. I had an apartment to pay for. I had things. Life goes on, right? And, and so I didn't have any money to date this girl, and she was high class, and I was not, and you know, so it was like way above my grade. And so, so I used to save all week long by not eating. So that I would have enough money at the end of the week to take her out to a movie and then go out to eat. And she would wonder on this date why I'd sit down to eat and just go like that. And they're like, how's your week, you know? Uh, because I was like starving to death. You should see my wedding pictures. I kid you not, I look like a dowel. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, and you say, why would anybody do that to themselves? Because it was worth it. There was a prize, there was a goal, and all in perspective, it was totally worth it. Listen, listen to this. The value of the spoil determines how fiercely you're willing to fight. The value of the spoil determines how fiercely you're willing to fight. How hard are we fighting for people? How hard do you think Satan is fighting for people? Because he comes to steal and to kill and destroy. You see, for Nehemiah, not fighting was not an option. Not getting involved was not an option. He said, I refuse to accept the state of Israel. I'm not going to accept it. And so this morning, what is unacceptable to you? What do you say that's unacceptable? And the value of the prize is worth the fairness of me. I'll tell you some things that's unacceptable to me. 23 million people in the sex slave trade industry across the world. That's unacceptable. That is sin at its highest. I'll tell you something that's unacceptable to me. 4,600 teenagers who snuff their lives out every year in America. 4,600 teenagers committing suicide. Totally unacceptable. I'll tell you something that's unacceptable to me. 1.2 million abortions a year. Destinies given by God snuffed out before they even see the light of day. I'll tell you something that's unacceptable. The divorce rate in the church equal to the divorce rate in the world. That's unacceptable. You see, Jesus promises us opposition. Jesus promises, he says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. It's not a cakewalk. 
It's not tiptoeing through the tulips, Tiny Tim. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be a fight. But Jesus said the violent take the kingdom by force. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers what? It suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. In other words, that the things that God wants to divest himself of, the things that God wants to benevolently give to people are not necessarily just given, they have to be taken. And sometimes they have to be taken by force because there's opposition, there's resistance. You see, God gives everybody in the world salvation. Jesus died for the sins of the world. It's out there, right? But there's so much opposition. There's an enemy that is fighting for the souls of people. There's an enemy that's fighting to keep people in spiritual darkness and spiritual blindness. And so he says, violent people take the things of the kingdom by force. By force. You know, sometimes when you, know, when you have little kids, you know, like you grab one of their teddy bears, you know, like, give it back, daddy, and they grab it, and you get in like this little tug of war with them, and then you, you release it to them, right? And so he's saying, this God has things, and we need to lay hold of them, and we need to take them violently by force because they're our heritage, and we have to overcome the opposition of the enemy. That's why Nehemiah said, don't be afraid of the opposition. Remember how awesome and how great your God is. Fight for your brothers. Fight for your sisters. You know, one of the things Nehemiah didn't do, he didn't engage the enemy. He didn't say, you know what, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, I'm going to come down there and knock your blocks off. He didn't. He kept building what God said build. He didn't stop building to fight the enemy. He fought the enemy by building what God said build. You want to know, you know, we don't fight the devil by saying, darkness, I curse you. Spirit of you know, the, uh, of, of the enemy. I cur- No, we fight the enemy by winning people to Christ. We fight the enemy by building what God wants us to build, by getting engaged and fighting for those people who aren't even fighting for themselves. Listen, if Nehemiah had not been willing to fight, then what would have happened? Where would have the prophetic destiny of God had been? Where would the, uh, the heritage, people who had not yet even been born, what would have happened to them if Nehemiah wasn't even willing to fight? Remember your God. Remember this, God is big and the devil is little. God is big and the devil is little. Sometimes we get that mixed up. God is big and the devil is little. There are people's eternities that are hinging in the balance of you and I being willing to fight for them. Paul uh, uh, had a vision of the Lord, and and the Lord was speaking to him in Acts chapter 8, and and the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid. There it is again. There it is again. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be be silent. Listen, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Keep on talking. Paul at this time is in Corinth. He's entered the city of Corinth, and when you look at the ancient world back then, Corinth was a seaport known for its degradation and its unbelievable immorality. And Paul goes into Corinth, and what does he find? Opposition. He finds resistance and he finds opposition and he backs up a little bit. And he's really wondering, is this where I need to be right now? And this is when Jesus appears to him and says, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. There are powers right now in the United States that are working vehemently to shut the voice of the church. Do whatever you want in your own four walls but keep it there because there's a separation of church and state. There is not a separation of God and his creation. This is exactly what they ran into in the book of Acts when they said, you will no longer speak that name of Jesus. And they said, dude, you decide whether we should obey you or whether we should obey obey mighty God. We've got a higher calling. We've got a higher purpose. We've got a higher destiny. And it's not to be politically correct. We're building the things of God. We're fighting for those who can't fight for themselves. And whether you think it's right for us to obey you or God, we don't care. We're going to keep on doing what God wants us to do. And this is the whole theme of the book of Acts. And this is when Jesus comes to to Paul and he says, listen, keep on going, keep on speaking. And then he says something really interesting. He says, for I have many people 
in this city. See, what would have happened if Paul quit fighting? We would have never had a church in Corinth. We would have never had the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians in our Bible. We would have never had a legacy of all the people that got saved over the years and trickled down and who knows how the influence or affected the world because there were many that belonged to Jesus. Here's the thing. In this region, in Raymond and Candy and Fremont and Deerfield and Epping and Northwood and Nottingham, there are people that belong to God. There are people that belong to God. And he says, I want you to be fighting for those who aren't even fighting for themselves because they don't know it, because the enemy has them in spiritual darkness. I want you to be engaged in that. Just, just, just this past week in California, a 12-year-old murdered his brother. Another 12-year-old murdered a homeless man. In Michigan, a 12-year-old murdered a nine-year-old, stabbed him to death. These are 12-year-olds. These are 12-year-olds. Now there's this new thing going out through social media. It's called the fire challenge where kids are pouring lighter fluid on themselves and lighting themselves on fire. It's the opposite of the polar challenge. You know the polar challenge, dunk in freezing water and get a brain freeze? This is light yourself on fire and jump in a bathtub or a swimming pool or shower and kids are dying. Kids are getting horribly disfigured with third degree burns. One girl just absolutely deformed her whole face because it's cool because kids are being kids because parents aren't parenting kids. Kids are left to hell wind and hell fire and the influences. And so, hey, I know something cool. Let's pour. In what universe and on what level is pouring lighter fluid on yourself and lighting yourself on fire acceptable? I find that totally unacceptable. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's the world that we live in. We're thinking, and you can, you don't, don't, hey, don't believe Pastor Ken. Google it. Go online. Check it out. The fire challenge. It's absolutely crazy what's going on out there. Sometimes I wonder, it's like, Lord, have you ever, have, have you looked, have you looked at what's going on in our world right now? Have you stopped and looked at what's going on? We, I mean, listen, this isn't a Republican thing. This isn't a libertarian thing. This isn't a democratic thing. We have one of the most dishonest administrations in the history of our country right now. We have a world that is unraveling with Syria and the Ukraine and Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq. We now have an Ebola scare that's sweeping the world. We have border crises here between us and Mexico. We have earthquakes and killer storms like all over the place. We have Israel fighting for her existence on a, on a speck of real estate in the globe. We have militant Islam it's rearing its head and going crazy. We have false religions and false worldviews. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the book of Revelation to me. That sounds like end time stuff to me. All of these things lining up. Knowledge being increased. Just the other day, I read that they are now taking these miniature micro microprocessors and now injecting them into the brain where people who have trouble seeing can see. People who have trouble hearing can hear. People have trouble smelling can smell. And I've always said it's only a matter of time before they begin to integrate the human brain with computers. And there will be super knowledge. Mark of the beast. Unbelievable, the stuff that's going on right now. And we have to look, as Jesus said, listen, work on this day because the night is coming when you won't be able to. How big of a fight are you fighting? How much do you value the prize of people? And is it worth getting in the fight for this is something that jesus talked about to the woman in the well when he met the woman of samaria at the well in john chapter 4 and after talking with her she went into her town and she said come see a man who told me all the things i've ever done this is not the christ is it and they went out of the city and were coming to him so this woman engages jesus of nazareth gets into a conversation of jesus of nazareth is blown out of her brain goes into the city and says i just met a guy that has really like messed me up up and I'm thinking maybe he's the Christ 
and they all get curious and they start coming out. The, the, city, the people of the city start coming out to, to check this Jesus out. And it's in this context that a few verses later, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he sees these people coming out of the city to engage him. And he says this in verse 35, do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. Jesus wasn't turning around and pointing at some agricultural piece of real estate and say, hey, you see that crop over there? Don't say there's four months to harvest. I say it's ready right now. That's not what he was talking about. He was looking at people created in the image of God, held in darkness by the blinding power of the devil, coming out of a city because they had heard about him, and they were hungry, and they were thirsting after righteousness, and they were coming to Jesus, and Jesus said, dude, check it out. You see this? Don't say that there's four months. Don't say that New England's hard. Don't say it's impossible to penetrate people's lives. See what's happening? I'm telling you right now. The harvest is white. Don't say maybe tomorrow, maybe next month, maybe next year. The harvest is white right now. People are what we're all fighting for. And I want to challenge you this morning to get a fight in you. To get a fight in you and to fight for those people who aren't even fighting for themselves because they don't know any better. When that kid punched me in the head that day, and the immediate adrenaline rush, and all the heightening of the senses and engaging in that fight, this is what God says. He's saying, man, everything that's in the peripheral just becomes focused on what's really, really, really important. Because one day, all too soon, every one of us are going to be done our lives. Like Joan of Arc said, we have one life to live, and then it's done, and we'll be standing before God. And the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. They will shine like the stars in the firmament of heaven forever. There are things we can do with our lives that are unwise. You know the Bible says bodily exercise it's good. Every doctor in the world tell you, exercise, 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 and I exercise. But you know what the Bible says? It profits little. Godliness profits much. Why? Because I can be like Arnold, you know, I just, they've never seen a tree as beautiful as me. I can be in perfect physical condition, and I'm still going to die. I'm still going to die. I can spend four hours a day in the gym and squander all that time, and I'm still going to be as stone dead as anyone else has dead. But godliness ushers me into the next life where Jesus said, whatever you do to build what I'm building, I will reward you. I like the concept of rewards. I like the concept of someday getting to heaven and the Lord says, this is what you got. Like the athlete who denies himself that bacon cheeseburger because he's seeing something in the future he's aspiring for. We deny ourselves some things to fight for the things that in the eyes of God really matter. So how big is the fight in you? Listen, one of the things that we do here at New Life to make it as easy as possible, we created these little You Are Invited cards. So you don't, well, Pastor, I don't know, you know, people ask me trick questions and I don't know where Cain got his wife and I don't know if God could make a rock so big that he couldn't lift it. And I don't, you know, could God make water wet? They ask me all these questions and I don't, you don't have to know none of that stuff. You really don't. Has Jesus touched your life? Has Jesus made any difference in your life? Has Jesus impacted your life at all? Is following Jesus the coolest life to be lived or what? And that's all you have to know. We're not trying to win arguments. We're just trying to shine a light. And you can grab any, we have a number of these cards right on the back. So you don't have to know anything. You can just meet somebody, you're talking with them, open up your billfold, open up your pocketbook and say, hey, you ought to come and check out our church. That's as easy peasy as it gets right there. Let's pray. Maybe you're here today and you don't even know why you're here. Something brought you to this church and you right now are not personally right with God through Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that we've been fighting for you. I've been fighting for you. 
because I know the reward of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is way beyond anything this life or this world can offer. Jesus died for you 2,000 years ago on a cross to give you forgiveness of all your sin and the hope and the promise of life forever. And you're here this morning, and I just sense there's someone here that this is ringing in your spirit. This is registering in your guts that you know that this is right. And God is speaking to you, and he's saying, now is the day. Now is the hour. And I want to give you a simple invitation, just like Jesus called people publicly. And he said, come and follow me. Today, he's speaking to someone's heart, and he's saying, listen, you, come and follow me. Start following me from this moment on. And so I'm going to ask you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around, I'm going to ask you this morning, if that's you this morning, you'd say, Pastor Ken, would you pray for me? I want to get right with God. I want to ask Christ to forgive me. I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart and into my life. If that's you right now, would you raise your hand where I can see it? Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to ask Jesus Christ into my heart. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Is there someone else? You say, Pastor, I want to ask Jesus Christ into my heart to be my Lord, to be my God. I want to live for Him. It, any dead fish can float downstream and go with the flow of the world. It takes somebody live to resist the oppression, to resist the opposition, and say, I'm going to live for Jesus. Joan of Arc didn't think it too high of a price to pay at the age of 19. 19! to be burned at the stake for her faith in Jesus Christ. Is there one more pastor? Pray for me. I want, to give, I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Some are rededications. Let's pray. Let's all pray this prayer together. You who raised your hands, just pray this in faith, just believing God. You know, actually, you know, uh, let me pause right now. Just, just stay in an attitude. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor Ken, I've, I've asked Jesus into my heart, but I feel like I've hit a fork in the road and Jesus is going one way and I've been going the other way. And I've got to admit, I am not where I need to be. And I need to come back. If that's you, heads are bowed again, eyes are closed. If that's you, would you raise your hand? You say, I'm just not where I need to be right now. Just put your hand up. Yes, yep, yep, yep. Yes, thank you. And I'm not going to ask this question, but before we pray, I'm going to include it in our closing prayer. How much fight do you have in you? What are the things that are unacceptable to you? What are the things that God is building that the opposition is hindering and you're not involved? You know, you say, well, I'm not going to. Jesus said, listen, you're either gathering or you're scattering. There's no neutral ground. There's no room in there for spectator or observation. He says you're either gathering or you're scattering. Where are you in that? And what does he say? Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Keep on sharing. Keep on inviting. Let's pray. For those of you that raise your hand for salvation, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Everyone's going to pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I understand I'm a sinner and that Jesus died for me. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me in your blood. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe you're the Son of God. You died on a cross. You were were buried. You were resurrected and ascended in heaven. And I say that you are my God. Change me in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for those that raise their hands for the first time for salvation, that you would be formed in their heart and their lives. That you would take them on the greatest adventure that they would ever imagine life could be. Lord, for those that said that they aren't where they need to be, that, God, you would heal their backslidings, that you would bring them back into step with you. Whatever it is that's separating them or pulling them away, whatever lies they may believe in, that, Jesus, you would be gracious and reach out to them and extend to them one more time and pull them close to your heart. 
And Lord, for those that aren't speaking, that aren't doing, that aren't fighting, that aren't even upset with anything that they see in their world, God, I pray that you would spark a passion that let revival begin in each individual heart. Let it begin right here in me and let it begin with me beginning to fight for those who aren't fighting for themselves. May I see the reward and the payoff and esteem it worth the fight that you want to call out of us to engage. And Lord, we just say that you are great and you are awesome and there is none like you. Be glorified in our lives in every way. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Greet somebody today.